Good evening. My name is Jim Turk. I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression. I want to welcome you uh, to tonight's event. Uh, and before doing that, there are a couple of people I want to thank. One is Mohammed Malis, who is from Environmental Defense, who I'm going to introduce in a moment, is one of the panelists who really did a lot of the work in helping put this together. And the other is Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator of the Center for Free Expression, does most of the real work in making these evenings possible. So tonight's event has the title of How the Secrets of Body Care and Cleaning Products Impact Your Health. We have a quite distinguished panel for you, and I'd like to introduce them. They'll come up as I'm introducing them. Uh, I'll go from west to east. Uh, Bruce Lamphere is a MD and a Master of Public Health, who is a clinical uh, clinician scientist at the BC Children's Research Institute and a professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Uh, Bruce is on the editorial boards of a number of environmental and public health journals and has an impressive record of research and publication. But over the past decade, Bruce has become increasingly vexed by our inability to control the pandemic of consumption, as he describes it, uh, the largely preventable worldwide epidemic of chronic disease and disability due to widespread exposure of industrial pollutants, environmental contaminants, and excess consumption. He's leading an effort to produce videos to enhance public understanding of how our health is inextricably linked with the environment and elevate uh, efforts to prevent disease. And you're actually gonna see one of his videos at the start of tonight's uh, discussion. Second, I'd like to wake, uh, welcome uh, Jamie McConnell. Uh, Jamie has worked in the environmental health field for nearly a decade and oversees uh, the Women's Voices for the Earth programmatic work. The mission of Women's Voices for the Earth, if you don't know about that organization, I'd encourage you to go to their website, uh, is based in the United States. And its mission is to amplify women's voices to help eliminate toxic chemicals that harm our health and our communities. It envisions a world where the earth is taken care of, workers are paid well and treated fairly, and there are no toxic chemicals in our homes, our communities, or our environment. In addition to seeing, overseeing the organization's programmatic work, Jamie, uh, uh, devises policy strategies on the state and federal level in the United States that will increase disclosure of ingredients and reduce the use of harm harmful chemicals in consumer and cosmetic products. She has successfully worked to pass California Senate Bill 258, which is the first bill in the United States to require disclosure of ingredients in household and institutional cleaning products. She is currently working to pass a bill in California that will require the disclosure of ingredients in professional sell-on products, and a bill in New York that will require disclosure of ingredients in menstrual products. Jamie has a master's degree in environmental studies from the University of Montana and a BA from UCLA. Uh, while attending the University of Montana, Jamie was named the a Doris Duke Confer Conservation Fellow by the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation. Our third panelist, from Ontario is Mohamed Malis. Uh, growing up in different parts of the world enabled Mohamed to grasp at an early age the intricate links between the environment, human health, and equity. After completing a degree in human biology and a master of public health at the University of Toronto, Mohamed researched tobacco control policy at the Ontario Tobacco Research Unit and helped develop chronic disease prevention policies for municipal and, pro and provincial governments. With his passion for fostering a healthy and just environment, Mohanad is now working towards the elimination of toxic chemicals as, the, as Environmental Defense's Toxic Program Manager. Toxics Program Manager. Sorry, let me say that correctly. Uh, in this position, he has played an active role in the campaign to uh, ban microbeads in uh, consumer products, promoting industry action on BPA and food cans, and leading the NGO campaign to reform Canada's toxics law at the federal level. Mohanad also maintains a strong interest in global health issues and contributed to the Environment and Economist Intelligence Unit's national health care reports. I understand he's also an avid hockey player and coaches the U of T varsity development program. Finally, our moderator, who's going to keep this panel moving along and uh, engaged in some active discussion, is Adria Vassell. She's an environmental journalist behind the best-selling Ecoholic book series uh, and Ecoholic column in Now Magazine. If you haven't read her column, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, she has written extensively on chemical hazards hidden in everyday items. She is also a lecturer here at Ryerson School of Journalism. 
She has a degree in politics and cultural anthropology from the University of Toronto and in magazine journalism from Ryerson. Just to give you a little bit of lay of the land, uh, we are going to begin with a video that Bruce kindly brought called Little Things Matter, the impact of toxic chemicals on developing brains. And then each of the panelists will have five minutes or so uh, to share some remarks. And after that, we will deep dive into our conversation. I'll encourage all my panelists to interject, throw chairs, get lively. <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to kind of you know, jump in when someone else is talking. This is Bruce's Little Things Matter, the impact of toxic chemicals on the developing brain. It's true, not all chemicals are bad, but toxic metals like lead and mercury are found in all of us. So are persistent toxins like PCBs and endocrine disruptors such as bisphenol A and flame retardants. We've been studying the impact of toxins on children for the past 30 years and reached the inescapable conclusion, little things matter. Toxins can have a lifelong impact on children. We've also discovered that extremely low levels of toxins can impact brain development. Let's take a look at the percent of children who are exposed to some of these toxins using a national study in the United States. To keep it simple, we'll use 100 children to represent all children. Mercury is found in 89% of children, primarily from eating large fish contaminated by pollution. Lead is detected in the blood of all children, regardless of race, income, or where they live. Over 80% of children are exposed to organophosphate pesticides, mostly from food. All children are exposed to PCBs, a persistent pollutant that was banned in the 70s but will linger for generations. Bisphenol A, or BPA, is found in 96% of children. PBDEs, a type of flame retardant, are found in 100% of children. But these toxins don't occur in isolation. Children are exposed to many toxins and dozens of untested chemicals all the time. Let's take a look at the body burden of a typical child, one toxin at a time. If each marble represents one part per billion of a toxin, this figure represents the body burden of a typical child. One part per billion is deceptively small. It is only about two tablespoons of sugar in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. But chemicals can be biologically active, even at very low levels. The chemical industry has tried to assure us that concentrations of these toxins are too small to cause harm. But chemicals designed by drug companies to alter behavior, like the prescribed dose of Ritalin, a drug commonly used to treat children with ADHD, is active at levels about the same or even lower than toxins found in the blood. Besides, a lot of studies have shown that some chemicals can be toxic, even at very low levels. As the body burden of PBDEs in pregnant women increases, the intellectual ability of their children decreases. Let's take a closer look. As the level of PBDEs in mother's blood increases from 10 to 100 parts per billion, the IQ scores of their children drop by about five points. We see a similar pattern with organophosphate pesticides. As the level of organophosphate pesticides in pregnant women increases from 10 to 75 parts per billion, the IQ scores of their children drop by about five points. In the 1960s, hundreds of children died from severe lead poisoning every summer. Since then, much lower levels of exposure have been shown to result in learning deficits and brain disorders like ADHD. In fact, the World Health Organization and other agencies agree there is no safe level of lead exposure. As the level of lead in children's blood increases from zero to 100 parts per billion, IQ scores drop by about six points. In contrast, an increase from 100 to 200 parts per billion results in an IQ drop of two more points. An increase from 200 to 300 parts per billion results in an IQ drop of another point. The impact of toxins on the developing brain is permanent. Children who are more heavily exposed to toxins won't reach the same peak cognitive ability as those who have lower exposures. These studies show that there is no safe level of exposure. They also indicate that the way we regulate toxins, which assumes there is a safe level, fails to protect children. The chemical industry argues that the effect of toxins on children is subtle and of little consequence. But that's misleading. Little shifts in children's IQ scores have a big impact on the number of children who are challenged or gifted. Let's go back to our original sample of 100 children 
and look at a typical distribution of IQ scores. Most of us have IQ scores that fall between 85 and 115 points. Only 2.5% of children have an IQ above 130, which is considered gifted. There are about 6 million children in this group. On the other end of the distribution, another 2.5% of children have an IQ below 70, which is considered challenged. The impact of exposure to a toxin like lead causes a 5-point drop in IQ. This shift results in a 57% increase in the number of children that are challenged, from 6 million to 9.4 million. There is a corresponding decrease in the number of children that are gifted, from 6 million to 2.4 million. Little shifts matter. The impact of exposure to another toxin, like flame retardants, results in a further increase in the number of children who are challenged, from 9.4 million to over 11 million there is a further decrease in the number of gifted children. Although many, or even most, chemicals are harmless, the cumulative impact of exposures to three or four toxins is overwhelming to imagine. In Canada and the United States, chemicals are used in consumer products and released into the environment before they are tested for toxic effects. By allowing children to be exposed to toxins or chemicals of unknown toxicity, we are unwittingly using our children as part of a massive experiment but it doesn't have to be this way. Like the European Union, we could require industry to prove that the chemicals they use aren't toxic before they enter the market. How can we avoid exposures to toxins or chemicals of unknown toxicity? The ultimate solution is to revise how we regulate chemicals. Consider writing a letter to your government representative and urge them to require industry to test their products before they are put on the market. There are a few simple ways you can reduce your child's exposure to toxins. Eat fresh or frozen foods. If possible, choose organic. Try to avoid canned foods and steer clear of heavily processed foods. If you are pregnant or planning to become pregnant, eat fish low in mercury. Don't use pesticides in and around your home. Check your home for lead hazards, especially if it was built before 1960. Frequent cleaning of floors and surfaces can help reduce children's exposures to lead, flame retardants, and other toxins in house dust. Thank you, Bruce, for that eye-opening and informative video. You're welcome. It's, one of a ser it's part of your series of videos. Uh, yes on these issues, so definitely check out your website. Do you mind sharing that right now? Uh, www.littlethingsmatter.ca. Perfect. And now we are, th we are going to begin with Jamie. Uh, each, as I said earlier, each of our panelists will take a few minutes to just chat about their work and some of their concerns related to toxins. And Jamie's going to kick things off. Um, so my name is Jamie. I'm the uh, Director of Programs and Policy at Women's Voices for the Earth. And I've been there for um, going on 11 um, years. And Women's Voices for the Earth, we're mainly focused on issues in the United States. But we work to uh, amplify women's voices to eliminate toxic chemicals that can harm our health um, and our communities. And we have a particular focus on women because women, because of our biological makeup, are more vulnerable to chemical exposure. Um, we, can buy, we can be impacted by chemicals differently. Um, chemicals build up in fat. Women just tend to have more fat than men. Um, we can pass exposure onto a developing fetus, and we're just exposed to more um, chemicals in the home. And that's really reflected in the programs and um, the products that we focus on um, in our work. Uh, for example, we focus on cleaning products. Women are still, unfortunately, doing the majority of the cleaning in the, in the household. I think it's about 70 um, percent, at least in, in the US. We tend to use more personal care products, like makeup and different shampoos, um, lotions. Um, and we tend just to use uh, professional salon products more. And not only that, um, more women tend to be um, in the salon workforce. And also, of course, women um, almost exclusively use um, feminine care products like tampons or pads or other period products. Um, and when I say feminine care, that also includes um, you know, douches, wipes, 
feminine sprays and feminine uh, deodorants. So those are our three kind of main focus areas. And what I wanted to do is just give you, in the short time that I have, give you a super brief overview of some of the chemicals that we're concerned about in these products. So with cleaning products, um, in the US, I, I'll, I'll talk about this more, but before the law passed in California that I worked on, um, there were no requirements for ingredients in cleaning products um, to be disclosed on the label or anywhere else on the website, for example. And so with cleaning products, you can have antimicrobial chemicals like triclosan. There are some other ones listed there. Quats um, is kind of uh, becoming, there's a lot more awareness about the impacts of quats, which are used as disinfectants. Um, quaternary ammonium count compounds. You can have solvents linked to reproductive effects like glycol ethers, 2-betoxyethanol is one that can be commonly found in cleaning products. Of course, you can have um, fragrance chemicals, which um, we'll probably be talking more about that as well. Um, but fragrance can be made up of dozens to hundreds of, of chemicals. So if you look um, like at a cosmetic, for example, if you look at the back of that um, cosmetic product, you'll see it'll just say fragrance. Um, and that means that there could be dozens or hundreds of chemicals. And we know um, that there can be, uh, some of those fragrance chemicals can actually be pretty nasty, but companies are not required to disclose what's, what's in them. They claim that fragrance is confidential business information. And I have to say, with all the disclosure work that I've done in the last decade, and the policy I've, policies I've worked on, the toughest thing to get past is the disclosure of fragrance to convince companies that they need to disclose fragrance because of the confidential business information, because companies, to them, fragrance is their signature. It's how they, they sell products, right? Um, and then you can, have, of course, have like acute um, and corrosive chemicals in cleaning products. So this is just kind of a brief overview. And I know um, Ange printed out some fact sheets that are um, at the table over there that actually list some of this stuff out. Um, the other big one, um, or other uh, focus that we work on is chemicals found in professional salon products. So you can have formaldehyde um, or methylene glycol um, releases formaldehyde gas in hair straighteners. So the, I don't know if this treatment's popular in Canada, it's huge in the US, Brazilian blowouts or other types of keratin hair straightening systems, they actually can release high levels of formaldehyde. Um, uh, and you know, styrene, toluene. And the reason why you have these chemicals in these products is because it's perfectly legal in the US and Canada um, to have harmful chemicals in, in consumer products because we don't have um, any you know, strong laws that require companies to test chemicals for safety before they're used um, in products. And that's not just like testing the individual chemical, but what happens when you, know, you have a composition of many different chemicals. Um, they're not required to test for that either. Um, so salon products and toxic chemicals in feminine care products. So in in pads, you can have um, dioxins and furons, pesticide residues, fragrance chemicals, tampons, um, there's similar issues. Um, douches, wipes, sprays, and uh, deodorant, fem care deodorants can have parabens, formaldehyde releasers, um, colorants, triclosan, um, allergens um, uh, in the fragrance ingredients. And in the US, um, ingredients in these um, products are not required to be disclosed. So with menstrual products, they're regulated as menstrual devices and there are no requirements for disclosure. Um, douches, wipes, and sprays, they are regulated as cosmetics. So the ingredients will have to be listed except for fragrance. It can just say fragrance. Now in Canada, actually, you guys are a step ahead of us because for tampons, not pads, but for tampons, um, Canada requires a listing of ingredients along with a description of the bleaching process. And I should, so just going back to the salon product slide really quickly, um, in the US, there's a loophole in the law where pro 
products that are used for um, professional use only, they don't have to disclose any ingredients on the label at all. So salon workers who are being exposed to these chemicals repeatedly for days on end, they, they don't have a right to know currently what's in the product. Whereas if you went into a retail store like Target, um, you could pick up a bottle of nail polish and all of the ingredients would be listed, except for fragrance. But um, salon workers currently don't have that right. Um, so I think this is just my last slide. I just wanted to talk briefly about some of the policies that I've worked on. Uh, it was mentioned California SB 258. This was the first law in the nation that requires disclosure of ingredients in cleaning products. California is a pr uh, significant place to have this victory because of its, um, it has such a large economy. If manufacturers have to start labeling products in California, they're just gonna do that. Um, for every other state because it's too cost prohibitive. That was um, the third time I've worked on that bill in California. It finally passed. We were in pretty intense negotiations with the cleaning product industry to get that done. And we were able to find a compromise um, that still protects confidential business information, um, but we feel it still gives um, folks the information they need to uh, protect their health, and I can go into more detail later. I'm, right now, I'm also working on a bill in New York um, that requires disclo disclosure of ingredients in period products, so tampons, pads, period underwear, and um, menstrual cups. Uh, another active bill I'm working on is a bill in California that requires the disclosure of ingredients in professional products. This is the second time I've worked on this bill in California. Um, last year it got held up, but it's looking really good this year, and I'm 99% um, confident that it's gonna pass. It actually has the support of industry, the, the beauty industry, which is huge. This bill does not require fragrance disclosure. Right now, um, we're really trying to just get parity with retail cosmetics which is probably why it's just easier. We, we haven't had as much of a fight trying to get it through. On the federal level, um, a, a bipartisan bill that has been introduced is the Personal Care Product Safety Act, and that basically would overhaul cosmetic safety in the United States. It actually doesn't require fragrance disclosure, but in the US, um, um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act has pa passed in the 1930s, and it hasn't been updated since. Um, so there's a real need um, to reform cosmetic safety. And this is something that we actually, even under um, the Trump administration, that we might see uh, move through the Senate this year. Um, and then on, also on the federal level, there's two, um, and things aren't looking good for, for these bills right now, but um, the Menstrual Product Right to Know Act, which is a disclosure bill, and then the Robin Danielson Feminine Hygiene Product Safety Act. That actually requires um, the National Institute of Health to do more research into the impacts these chemicals that are found in these products are having on women's health, because there's, we, we don't really know. Um, and that's important information to have. So I think I'll leave it, I'll stop there, and then I'm happy to answer questions when we get to that point. Thank you. So much we could dive into from there, um, but we will hand it over to Mohanad to share a few comments, if you don't mind. Sure, um, it's a question to Jamie. The, the Cosmetics um, Act in the US, how, how long is it? Because I remember hearing that it was like a page and a half long. Oh yeah, it's a page like and that. a half. So it just, it just kind of <laughs> gives you a picture, and I know this is US, uh, Specific, but I mean, kind of. It, it, in Canada, we have you know very similar kind of approaches to dealing with uh, toxic chemicals and and to you know how we regulate cosmetics. I mean, there are some technical differences, but really it, the issue of exposure to toxics from cosmetics and from from cleaning products and other products that consumers use every day has been neglected um, from a policy uh, perspective and from a legal perspective. Um, so I won't spend time introducing myself, but just very quickly, uh, my name is Mohamed Malas, and I manage the Toxics Program at Environmental Defense Canada. Uh, we're a environmental charity organization. Uh, we focus on uh, mostly national issues, but we do also work on provincial issues in Ontario and Alberta, 
and uh, at the municipal level, in specifically in Toronto, where I work on the dry cleaning campaign that we've we've had for a number of years to try to move towards uh, safer al alternatives to the toxic chemicals used in dry cleaning. Um, so, I guess my introductory remarks will focus specifically on the policy context in Canada, uh, because Jamie spent quite a bit of time talking about, you know, some of the the chemicals that we we're. Uh, you know, concerned about in these products, and um, Bruce's video is, was telling enough about you know why this is a, a situation or a case that we should be paying attention to. So, a few things that I wanted to, I guess, reiterate, or a few points I wanted to reiterate is, or are, um, so products are not tested for safety before they enter the market in in Canada and in the U.S. Um, and right now we have more than 85,000 chemicals that are on the market that are being used in all sorts of products and in, you know, for, you know, used for, for industrial uses and, and several other purposes. In Canada, we've only comprehensively studied um, probably about 3,500 chemicals so far. So a small fraction um, of, of the you know, tens of thousands of chemicals that are being used on the market. And we don't have a law in Canada that requires a disclosure of ingredients, uh, the full disclosure of ingredients in consumer products like cosmetics and personal care products or cleaning products or even other product categories like furniture, for example, which is an area of concern because of exposure to flame retardants. So on a cleaning, cleaning products um, product category, I guess, the, there's an, there was an interesting survey that was done by the David Suzuki Foundation in 2014, and I thought it was really a brilliant uh, survey because what they did was they asked Canadians from across the country to look at their cleaning products and report back uh, on whether the products that they had in their homes had ingredient lists. And out of 15,000 uh, products that people reported back, only 50% actually had an ingredient list of some sort. So those ingredient lists that were there were basically uh, a choice that the company made to provide people with, with ing ingredients. Um, and out of those 15,000 products, 25% of them made green claims. So you know, said things about how they are organic or green or environmentally safe uh, without providing any evidence or data or certification that they were actually green. So really, we're, we're dealing with a situation where we have a lot of uh, lack of information, but also misinformation uh, around these, these products. For personal care products, we have the issue of fragrance, where fragrance is exempted from being listed on the label. And as Jamie mentioned, it could be dozens to hundreds of chemicals that go into the, the makeup of that fragrance. Now, the industry argues that the reason why they don't want to list the ingredients of the fragrance is because it's a trade secret and this is important for their business. And, but today, that, doesn't, that argument doesn't hold anymore because there are you know, machines that people could use to reverse engineer or reverse, um, you know, figure out what the ingredients of the fragrance just by using a simple you know, procedure using a machine in a lab. So that really, that argument is, is an outdated argument. And that's one of the reasons why um, you know, policymakers and, and you know, the Canadian um, politicians and in the US and other, and other jurisdictions should move on, um, I guess, making sure that, that that exemption is no longer there. So Canada is really falling behind when it comes to labeling. Um, in, in, we know in the EU they have labeling of um, toxics in cleaning products. Um, that's also recently in California, there was a, a, a law passed that would require the disclosure of all the chemicals in, in, that go, go into the cleaning products that, that are on the market. But also California had Proposition 65, which is a, a basically a labeling um, regulation that would require companies to label any product that contains um, something like a, a cancer-causing chemical. And, and that law has been in place since 1986 or 85 or something, so over 30 years. Um, and we still haven't even made you know, one step forward for better labeling in Canada. 
Um, now in Canada, uh, we have the situation is, is quite alarming uh, because for cosmetics, for example, um, companies don't even have to register the product or the ingredients of the product until 10 days after the first sale. So anyone can make a product and sell it. And then and, you know, at 10 days after you sell it, you have to provide the list of ingredients um, and register the product with Health Canada. So we have a, a post-market system, uh, which is problematic. Now, the Auditor General um, Office of Canada, so the Environmental Commissioners uh, specifically, and her team in 2016, I believe, looked at cosmetics policy in, in Canada and found that um, Health Canada doesn't even do regular testing um, of products or you know, fact-checking labels. Um, and that's very problematic because we have the system where companies can just submit information about a product, but nobody's actually checking that information. And if you think about the fact that chemicals are not tested for safety before they enter the market, you know, it, it, that, that system just doesn't make sense from a health and safety perspective. Now, obviously, the benefits um, for labeling, you know, are are, they're, they're quite obvious. Uh, people want to know what they're buying. They want to know what goes into the products that they're using uh, for, you know, on their skin, uh, that they're using for their children. And we have been at Enrompte Defense really uh, looking at uh, you know, public opinion on, on this issue uh, because we want to provide that information to decision makers and, and members of parliament uh, that you know, people support this and, and you need to do this because uh, voters in Canada would like to see better labeling. So in Canada, we have um, recent surveys found that 96% of, of Canadians support labeling of products. Um, and two years ago, um, I worked with a research firm to do focus groups to talk about these issues with, with Canadians. And um, people not only supported the full disclosure of products, but they really supported the idea of having warnings. So similar to what we see on tobacco products or um, you know, often when you walk into a, a liquor store, you would see a sign that says, um, you know, that provides a, sort of a warning uh, about drinking while, during pregnancy. Uh, so sort of that idea in mind where, you know, we, what people need is not more information, is not more complex, you know, chemical names that they, they won't understand. They want to know if this product contains something that is bad for their health or for the environment. And based on that, they will make the choice if they want to buy that product. So that was something that was that came up in, in, the, in the focus groups and the surveys that were done, um, and you know the cases there for public support. But there's also another benefit that is often missed by uh, decision makers and by members of parliament and ministers, which is when you require labeling for a to toxic chemicals, then you're going to push industry to find alternatives. So if you require uh, labeling, let's say plastic bottles for BPA, then anyone that uses BPA, um, if, they, if you tell them, now you're going to have to put a label on your bottle that says, this bottle contains BPA, which is an endocrine disruptor or hormone disruptor, then they're going to start looking for an alternative that is not BPA. So the benefits um, are not just you know, on the right to know, but also they have uh, their, their impact on the market. And we've seen it in the US where in California, because of the rules around labeling, um, a lot of companies moved away from using uh, lead in uh, plum plumbing supplies and also in food cans. Um, and recently, because of uh, recent rules around using flame retardants in furniture in California, we're seeing a drop in the use of flame retardants in furniture, uh, or at least some specific flame retardants. So the, the benefits are really um, significant. Um, and I think there's an economic opportunity that people don't think about here. <laughs> and Bruce, if you don't mind yeah. uh, saying a few words. Sure. So I'll add a little bit onto the, the video. Um, most of my work early on focused on finding ways to prevent lead poisoning. What I realized is once the science was mature, once we knew the problem, that there was no safe levels, we knew where the sources were, um, we knew how to prevent it. That was about 10 years ago, and yet we didn't. And that's, that was always, for me, the promise of doing public health research, science, is that 
once a problem is identified, as a society, we would do something. Now, this is before I immigrated to Canada. That was about 10 years ago. Um, we estimated, for example, that about one out of three cases of ADHD in US children, that's one million cases, could be attributed either to lead or tobacco exposure. Now, just imagine for a moment, if I had designed a drug or a vaccine that could prevent one out of three cases of ADHD, I'd be wealthy. I'd have endowed chairs, wouldn't I? We got a little scholarly attention, but not much else. And then we began to study not just lead and PCBs and mercury, those first generation poisons, toxins that we kind of knew about. We began to put together a birth cohort in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then we put one together in Canada. And what we began to find out is that those metals were just really the tip of the iceberg. So tri triclosan, for example, phthalates, bisphenol A, pesticides, of course the metals. So we, we put this video together before we had that data, but the exposures that are going on in Canada to pregnant women, to children, to the rest of us are very similar. For most of those chemicals, 80, 90% of us are regularly exposed. And one of the things that really worries me about this or bothers me about it is for many chronic diseases, who do we blame? You. Your lifestyle choices that lead to chronic disease, don't you know? But in fact, that's often not the case. In many cases, we can't control what we're exposed to or we don't know what we're exposed to. Or we don't know that when we're exposed to this or that, that they're toxic, that they have uh, hazards that we should be worried about. Or when bisphenol A is taken out of water bottles, the companies put in another type of bisphenol that might ultimately shown to be just as toxic. And you know what? You don't get to know. It's proprietary. And so this has been going on. And so even as we've learned about the old toxins, lead, mercury, and PCBs, guess what? Whoops, we're doing it again. And some of these things get into our environments. They get into the animals, they can damage wildlife, they can damage the food that we eat. We've been telling pregnant women not to eat certain types of fish for years. I mean, just stop and think about that. Fish are one of the healthiest things that you can eat. And when you're pregnant, you can't eat some of it because we've contaminated it. That was mercury. And now fish have PBDEs, flame retardants, plastics and a number of other toxic chemicals. We're doing it again. We haven't learned. So what I began to do is to try to find out how can we begin to take some of that information and make it more widely available. And so we started to make videos. And this is a team of people. My brother's the graphic designer, and we usually have about five or six people that, that work with us to go through each of the scripts, particularly for, for academics. We need help to be able to talk normal. So we go through and they help us script it so it's simple. My job is to make sure it's accurate. Their job is to make sure it's simple, that anybody could understand, which is the way I learn anyway. I get it down to its simplest level and then I get it. So how do we bring about change? We need two things, good science, good information, and we need, we need moms to get pissed off. That oftentimes is how things change. The science by itself isn't enough. And just going to sit on science advisory boards or talking to politicians, that's not enough. It's got to come from the community because there's so much vested interest in continuing to use these products even when there's evidence of toxicity. And for too long, we've put profits of industry over the protection of people. And for too long, we blame people for their lifestyle choices for things that they can't control or they're not informed about or that's proprietary. And so even though I trained as a scientist, it's really about how do we take that science and help make it into policy to help use it to protect people. I want to end with, a, with an anecdote. Joel Bakken, who's a, a lawyer at UBC and a friend, 
Um, he's written a couple books. One was called The Corporations, which was made into a documentary. And then the next one uh, was called Childhood Under Siege, How Big Business Targets Children for Profit Through the Media, Through Drugs, Through Environmental Chemicals. And he was interviewing me about how different environmental chemicals impact children. He's going through this litany. And after about five or 10 minutes, he says, wait a minute, stop, stop. You do this for a living, right? I said, yes. You have kids, yes. Can you protect your own children? No way. There's too many. I can keep up with five or 10 chemicals at best, really become familiar with five or 10 chemicals. And I can, you know, I rely on a few other colleagues, but in the end, that's not enough. In the end, we need our regulatory agencies to step in and say, look, we've learned a lot over the past 100 years. We've learned that even low-level exposures to chemicals can be toxic. We've learned that people can't control their exposures without help. We've learned that industry, left to their own devices, too often will manipulate the system and try to figure out how to thwart regulatory efforts. This is not my opinion. These are just simple facts. And as Mohanad talked about, regulations can actually help spur innovation, spur safe products, ultimately reduce liability for industries. But guess what? They need our help. They need those regulations. Thank you. Listening to all three of you, it is clear I think to all of us here that we are just stewing in toxins coming in from all directions, from all the products we come in contact with every day. Uh, and at the same time, you know, when you look around and you go shopping, how many of you have seen paraben-free labels on products out there? How many of you have seen products advertising that they're free from some kind of chemical hazard? More and more, right? And so we kind of get this sense, oh, it's getting safer, products seem to be greener. Um, over the course of my 10 years doing this, it's, it seems to the naked eye that this might be happening. And I'd like to get all your opinions on how much progress we have made. And if we have made any, or are we just kind of being seeing a few more green products on shelves today? I can take a stab at that one, or, or start, start us off. I mean, one thing we've been talking a lot about tonight is policy, but, and that's one of you know, the tactics my organization uses to increase our right to know and eliminate the use of toxic chemicals. But what has also been extremely effective is our market campaigns. And so that's when we're targeting specific companies like SC Johnson or Clorox you know, or, or Reckitt Benkiser that makes Lysol. That is, policy takes a long time. Like when um, that policy in California that passed for disclosure, I've been working on that for 10 years. Um, we finally got to a place because industry was already making some of these changes because we were targeting them. We were having women call the company and say, I wanna know what's in the products that I use. And that's also one of the reasons why we focus on women is because women are an extremely powerful consumer group. We make over 85% of decisions of what to buy. So if, a, if, if, if you're calling a company and saying, I'm not gonna buy your products, I don't know what's in it, or you're asking questions, companies listen to that. And over the last decade or so, we've seen the major cleaning product companies in the US disclose more and more. We were, you know, when we were talking to them, starting to have conversations with these companies, because we talked to them one-on-one -on -one to say, look, you need to do this, you need to disclose more, you need to remove the, these chemicals. They were like, there's no way we're gonna be able to disclose fragrance, just no way, or, or people don't wanna know that. And then we said, oh really, let's show you. And we organized our tiny organization of eight women, or organized women in the US to contact companies and that, has made um, a huge difference. So I think let's not just focus on the policy too, let's have hold companies accountable. And so don't underestimate the power of calling that 1-800 number on the back of the bottle, it's huge. Um, and that's not to say we don't, that's a substitute for policy, but I think in the interim, that's an effective tactic. And it also pushes these companies to the table to, to support policies like the one um, that we have in California. So I would say that, yes, companies are more aware now um, because of just consumer awareness about the issue. 
that doesn't mean, I, don't, I wouldn't say that products are getting safer necessarily because the other problem is you have regrettable substitution, which is what Bruce was talking about. Oh, consumers don't like BPA, and then they're replacing it with BPS, which they're finding is just as, as harmful. Um, and, um, and so what we need, like ultimately, is a strong regulatory structure that requires companies to prove the safety of these chemicals before they're, they're putting them on the market. Otherwise, you can have these, oh, phthalates are bad, parabens are bad, but if there's no system in place to ensure that the chemical they're gonna be using instead um, is gonna be safer, then we're just continue to be, gonna be in this cycle of having harmful chemicals in products or, or chemicals of emerging concern. Um, it so maybe I'll like stop a by that. giant game of whack-a-mole, really. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of, it really is. And one of the things we've kind of shifted to as we talk to cleaning product companies in our conversations with them um, is that you need to have, we released a report called Health First, and that is really en encouraging and pushing companies to ha um, implement a strong chemical management system. Um, because right now you'll, you'll hear like SD Johnson or like a Clorox, they say, our, it's safe, our products are safe. And you're like, well, how do we know that? How, how are you defining safe? Because um, they aren't transparent about that. So we're really trying to push them to become more transparent about how the criteria that they're using to evaluate chemicals for safety um, and to put a robust chemical management system in, in place. Um, just you see like with carbon, releasing carbon, companies will be putting that, touting that in their sustainability reports. Um, and we've really been uh, pushing them to, don't just talk about that, talk about what you're doing to reduce your chemical footprint. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Yeah, I, I would add that, I mean, I don't see proof that things are getting safer, even though we keep seeing these messages that this is paraben free or you know, BPA free. Um, but what I do see is that we're using more product mm. today compared to 10 years ago and 20 years ago. So I think in one estimate on average, women use 16 personal care products and cosmetic products every day. There is a um, cream for every single sector yeah. quadrant yeah. of your body. <laughs> right. Yeah. So cumulatively and additively, we're ex being exposed to, I would say, more um, you know, chemicals that we m may know are harmful or and chemicals that we don't know much about. And we still haven't figured out, even though we, we have the approaches scientifically, but from, from a policy perspective, um, agencies like Health Canada are still not doing uh, a good job to assess cumulatively how much are we getting exposed to and how is that impacting our health. And also over time, you know, someone using products for 10 years uh, compared to you know using them for two days, so we, we need to better understand these things. And and th there are scientific methods that are there, but it just takes you know uh, will from from government agencies and also um, industry has to s step up and make sure that they're doing their their job in testing these these mm -hmm. chemicals. Um, and that regrettable substitution piece, uh, which is replacing one bad chemical with another bad one, so BPA with BPS. Um, phthalates, which are used in fragrance uh, very um, frequently, I would say, in, in most products, there's some sort of uh, phthalate. And we're seeing that some of the phthalates that we know more about and a lot of jurisdictions like Europe are designated as toxic are being reduced uh, in, in terms of use for in some products, but then we're seeing new phthalates coming up and being used instead. So, you know, that there are a lot of questions to be asked about those new chemicals that are being used. And this is what happens, I guess, when you're regulating, even at best, regulating out one toxin at a time, like, let's say, targeting triclosan, but not other antibacterial chemicals. So, yeah. Bruce, you seem to see some progress on the bigger, heavier, uh, you know, old established hazards. Is that happening? Or? Yeah, certainly, if you look at things like lead, uh, that's come down quite dramatically across North America, Europe. Um, one of the problems, though, is when you restrict or ban products like lead or pest, certain pesticides or tobacco, 
uh, in North America, uh, industry then begins to sell them to industrializing countries or the low to middle income countries. And so then we start to see chronic diseases rise there. And that's exactly what's been happening. Canada knows nothing about this related to asbestos, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, we that's weren't right. selling it to anyone and not using it ourselves. But. So we're making progress in some ways. You can see there's more, uh, certainly uh, consumers are more savvy about it. They're more interested in it. That's obviously picking up, whether it's uh, organic food, whether it's the type of, of products they, they choose to buy. Uh, but too often it's one at a time that, that we're trying to deal with. Uh, whether you work at, on, on a retailer or at the city or state level, uh, that's where a lot of innovation is happening, but it typically is often one thing at a time. And uh, there's over 100,000 chemicals out there. It's going to take a long time to get through those unless we change the way we regulate all of them. And at this point now today, who is most at risk from exposure to all these toxins? And how are marginalized communities perhaps more affected? Well, certainly you can begin to, I mean, we tend to look at uh, some of the marginalized communities uh, where they may live closer to the highways. Uh, highway pollution has, has been associated with lung cancer, chronic lung disease, uh, heart disease deaths, um, maybe autism, asthma in children, uh, ADHD type symptoms. And it's kind of hard to say, why is there so many things? But it's a, it's a cocktail of different toxic gases, metals. Uh, it's not one thing. And uh, some of those are fine enough, small enough, not only do they get into the bloodstream, but they can be found in, in brain tissue. And so uh, when you have communities living near the highway, maybe higher levels of secondhand smoke, maybe older homes that's not well maintained, that's lead, pesticides being used. So a lot of those will concentrate in, in marginalized communities. And Jamie, you've seen some of those toxins also accumulate in marginalized communities that are related to cosmetics and body care as mm -hmm. well, right? Um, like with feminine care um, products, specifically um, douches and wipes um, tend to be used more by um, Latina and black women. And there was a recent study, and, and douching as well, and there was a recent study that came out of um, George Washington University on um, douching in black women. And black women who douched had higher levels of phthalates. Um, in their body compared to white women. And these are products that are heavily marketed to women of color. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I don't know if folks have um, seen this in the news, but Johnson & Johnson has been sued around their use of talc um, in baby powders, which a lot of women right. use as a feminine care product. Um, in their internal documents, um, they were actually talking about, instead of just like getting rid of talc, because even their own studies showed that there was, some, there was some concern about its link with ovarian cancer, they said we need to, they started actually put that they're going to start marketing more to women of color. Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. As a marketing strategy. Mm-hmm. Mm. So who's going to jail? Yeah. Yes, good Well, question. they've been... <laughs> They're going to have to pay money, but that's not enough for sure. They are being sued, and they have getting... settled, I think, on a certain number to... And one has been repeal, appealed, and yeah, it's not enough, basically. Yeah, if your talc gives you ovarian cancer, how much is that right. worth at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, and I would add that lower-income families and young, younger people um, who may not be able to afford you know, the expensive, organic, non-toxic products that are available um, are also at risk. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's something that we, we need to, you know, there, there are people who are more biologically vulnerable, so pregnant women, young children, um, because of the rapid development that's happening in their bodies and the role of hormones in, in, during those develop, in, the, in the development. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there are people who are also sort of being left out in a conversation of, around regulating toxics. And, and those are people who are often, you know, as um, well, both Jamie and Bruce's points around the marginalized communities and, and people, but also, you know, lower income uh, people in general uh, are often exposed to more toxics from cosmetics, personal care products, but also things like food cans. And, you know, if you think about pesticides because of, um, you know, how expensive organic you know, produce can be. So that's something that we should be mindful of as well. Yeah, I think if I could just add, yeah. I think that's a really important point because we can't shop our way out of the problem. It's not about, well, what can I use instead? That may be a, a, a super short-term solution, but everybody 
um, has a right to walk into a store, buy a product, whether it's a seventh generation product or a product that Clorox makes and just know, know that it's safe. You know, like just for baby mattresses, when I had my two kiddos, um, a, 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 a mattress, a crib mattress without flame retardant is hundreds of dollars. I was lucky because my parents <laughs> bought, bought our crib mattresses for us, but now they're getting ready to go into a twin bed. And I'm, you know, it's hundreds of dollars and I, I can't afford it. I cannot afford to spend $300, $400 on a, on a mattress. And parents shouldn't have to make that choice. Um, so that's, that's a really important point. And, and that's where when labeling and regulation sort of um, become really important because the reason why these products are expensive is because the sort of green chemistry market, the demand for green chemistry market is, is there, but it's not high enough. So a lot of these chemicals and, and, product, and substances that are, that are used as alternative to the toxics um, are still expensive to use. So once you have more companies being sort of forced to, to find a greener alternative, uh, whether it's because they have to disclose that they use you know, parabens or BPA or, or something else that's um, something else that's hazardous, or because you ban a chemical, now you're going, you know, the, the prices of these alternative that are greener and safer will go down and everyone will be able to, you know, afford a lot of products that are now unaf unaffordable. As opposed to being niche products as they are today. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a big, do you, do you have dollar stores in Canada? We do. We definitely so there's do. a big, you know, campaign um, in the U.S. and maybe it's extended here, but it's a dollar store campaign because um, a lot of people um, who are lower income buy their products in dollar stores. It's cheap, right? Um, a buck for a cleaner or, or whatever it is. And um, they're actually finding that some of those products can be even more toxic, but um, they're cheap and they're available and there's usually a dollar store in every, you know, um, <laughs> or close to every neighborhood. Um, so that's that's been a really, that's not a campaign that we lead, but um, I think it's been a really important one um, to draw attention to um, the fact that dollar stores can have, you know, some of the most harmful chemicals in some of their products, whether it be cleaners or like a tablecloth. Bruce, even with some of the major known hazards that the government says, yes, we know lead's bad, we know asbestos is bad, et cetera, um, they'll say, you know, but if you, in small concentrations, it's okay in lipstick. And okay, sorry, Claire's had a bit of asbestos in their makeup, but we don't even have the power of recall, I think, in Canada. Uh, but is, there, is it possible to get down, to completely eliminate these trace contaminants, which would never be on labels? And you know, what do we do about those? So some, some of the chemicals are persistent, uh, like PCBs, uh, lead, those are going to stick around longer. Others, uh, some of the newer chemicals, uh, while they're worrisome because even at parts per trillion, sometimes they can have uh, impacts on the hormone system, uh, they tend to be non-persistent. That's not entirely true because PBDEs, PFCs, the Teflon-like chemicals, those are also persistent, but we've tended to move towards non-persistence. Uh, so some of them we could actually imagine getting rid of in you know, a decade, for example. Others, it's going to take a long time. Um, but I think the point is that we keep making the same mistake or failing to learn from the, the old lessons. And as long as we keep doing that, um, we're bound to cause more harm. Mm. And you could begin to, to list. I mean, if we went through and listed all the common problems that some of these chemicals are associated with, I'm sure most of us would have at least one of those conditions. Um, there's probably half a dozen of these chemicals that cause thyroid disruption. And that's particularly concerning during pregnancy because uh, the mother has to produce more thyroid for the developing child. The, the, the fetus doesn't produce its own thyroid. And it's being bombarded by many, perhaps dozens, of these chemicals that can disrupt the thyroid. So you mentioned earlier the problem of chemical <laughs> mixtures and what happens when a pregnant woman and the, and the developing child are exposed to six or more of these uh, thyroid disruptors. That's so critical for brain development. It makes me think of another question, especially considering you're a doctor. Um, why aren't more doctors warning pregnant women about these toxins? I mean, we hear them warning about mercury and fish. Um, they are saying that, but there's a whole list of other ingredients, I mean, thousands of them. Yeah. 
One of the things that, I, and this, we just released a new video today about this, cause or cure. And part of the question is why are we so um, caught up in finding these cures, right? New drugs, uh, stem cells, genetics, these are going to solve our health problems. Uh, that may have made sense 50 years ago, right? Chronic diseases were on the rise, cancer, learning problems in kids, behavior problems. Kids. These were on the rise, and, you know, people were suffering. We wanted to do something. We wanted to find ways to treat them, to, to, you know, to, to ease their suffering. That made sense. Over the past 50 years, though, what we've begun to recognize is that many of those chronic diseases have as major risk factors some of the pollutants and the toxic chemicals we've talked about. And we've gotten so caught up in this never-ending, never-elusive search for cures, we can't take our eyes off of it. And we shouldn't, in one sense, we'd like physicians to get involved with this, but physicians are largely focused on what happens in the clinic walls. And I'd like that to change. Uh, there's some of us that do try to get outside of what happens inside a hospital or the clinic walls. Uh, but what we really need are different kinds of people in public health. Mm. Right? So the last century, tremendous increase in life expectancy. That was not because of medical care. It was largely because of better water, better housing, better control of drugs that were toxic. So when we think about health, we've got to think beyond just what happens inside the clinic walls. And much of what happens, in fact, most of what happens that keeps us healthy happens outside of hospitals. Speaking of ideas for solutions, um, Mahana, do you have a lot to say about labeling, as I'm sure you all do? Um, so is this because we can't get government to just ban these tech toxins, so we're better off at least being warned about them? Is this what we're kind of hoping for with the labeling system? Um, no, I think, I think labeling complements regulation. I don't think it's a solution. I think we need labeling and we need better regulations and stronger bans on toxics. Um, and it's, it's just, it's really part of the, the mix of, of policy solutions that are out there. Um, and we know we've, we've seen, we've seen it being implemented in some states in the U.S. and Europe, and we know what it can do. Um, and Canada has, you know, we, we have a, a, a law in Canada that is, um, the main law that guides pollution prevention and regulation of toxics. It's called the Canadian Environmental, Environmental Protection Act, and it's, the last update of this act was in 1999, so that was almost two decades ago. And when it was rewritten in 1999, it was really rewritten to, to deal with some of the industrial pollution that, were, uh, that was a problem at the time. But today, the problem is really more from exposure to toxics in, in consumer products. We still have industrial pollution, obviously. We still have a lot of issues around vulnerable communities and marginalized communities that are you know, in pollution hotspots, um, whether that's in Ontario's Chemical Valley um, or in, in Alberta, near the tar sands. Right. Uh, but the issue of toxic exposure from consumer products um, and from air pollution and, and everywhere, this whole cumulative exposure issue um, is an issue that the law has, was not written back in the, in the day to, to address. So over the past 19 years, um, the law was reviewed twice, and in both times it, it didn't really lead or result in any um, improvements. And that's because, I mean, the industry has a quite uh, strong voice in these issues, and, and often um, when you don't have a willing sort of government, um, it, it's much harder to, to get things um, you know, passed, like amending a law. But right now, we actually have a bit, very big opportunity because a, a group of, so a committee from Parliament, so uh, members of Parliament reviewed um, the toxics law in Canada and spent 15 months talking to experts and um, environmental groups and health groups and doctors and industry and basically concluded that this law is very outdated and had 87 recommendations on how to improve it. It was actually a, a, a mar remarkable report because it almost... You know, just reading it uh, to me was um, it was so rewarding because for years a lot of people who were working on this area just wouldn't get this sort of recognition. Um, and right now we are awaiting a response from the environment minister on you know what should be done uh, about this this law. One of those recommendations is labeling. One of them was actually to label all consumer products that contain toxics. 
and uh, the law itself actually authorizes the Minister of Environment and Minister of Health to do to be to do that. So we have a legal um, mechanism or you know the legal ability to do it, but it's just about you know the ministers responsible to say yes, we will do it, and then once we get that um, sort of announcement and that commitment. Um, there are so many examples from other countries where we can borrow, borrow from and come up with a strong um, you know, policy solution on labeling and better you know, toxics regulations. At this point, we have very little right to know in Canada. Is that right? Yeah, so the, the right to know issue is, um, I mean, we, uh, I've spoken to Jim about a number of topics that are on right to know and, and, and toxics, and this is one specific area where you know, we're talking about consumer products like cleaning and personal care products, but we, we actually have a bigger problem around, um, you know, Canadian law does not recognize, um, and federal law uh, doesn't recognize our right to a healthy environment. Um, there, I think there's, there are over 150 countries in the world that has some legislated right to a healthy environment. We don't have that. And when I speak to some uh, colleagues from American and European um, NGOs, non-government organizations like Environmental Defense or Women's Voices for the Earth, they find out mind-boggling because they're like, oh wow, Canada's an environmental country, like you guys like, your, you love your environment and you love your outdoors, but we don't actually have um, that right in, in our laws and, and a part of that right is access to information, access to um, you know, things like ingredient lists on your products, um, and also access to information around you know, uh, the, what, what industry is producing in terms of chemicals, um, new chemicals that are, that are being uh, registered with Health Canada. All this information is still a black box for us, so we, there's a lot to be done. I guess when you mandate the ingredients on, let's say, a cleaning product, we might not, you know, the everyday consumer be able to go, okay, I know what every, of these, every one of these ingredients is or are, but then you guys can step in and say, ah, this one's toxic, we're gonna label that a hazard, et cetera. Uh, Jamie, I'm curious, coming from the States as you do, uh, we always talk about California as this kind of, you know, gold standard in terms of regulating toxins and labeling toxins. They've got this warning system where, you know, anytime, and we've, we've mentioned it a few times, where, you know, product or a business like a tattoo parlor will have a warning sign saying, warning, this product contains an ingredient known to the state of California to cause cancer or birth defects. Um, but you know, I've mentioned this to my readers over and over again, saying we need this here in Canada, we need this here in Canada. And finally, someone from California wrote in and she said, you know, in California, these warning labels are on everything. Like yeah, walk by a parking is. lot, go into a store, it's on a can mm -hmm. of beans, it's it. You start to tune them out. Mm -hmm. So if we bring, the, do you recommend that we bring the system to Canada? And is there a fear of kind of warning fatigue? <laughs> does, it, does it start right. to wear off? That's a really good, that's a good question. Um, I don't think warning la labels should be a substitution for full ingredient disclosure. Um, I think in California, it, it's been helpful, especially to organizations who wanna sue companies for having, it's in California, it's ca called Prop 65. And so if a company, and, and we actually did this, we tested Tide, um, it's a product by Procter & Gamble. It's one of their best-selling laundry detergents. We, detest, we tested it for harmful chemicals. We found high levels of 1,4-dioxane in there. Then we took that information to a group um, that, um, of attorneys that works in California, specifically on Prop 65 lawsuits. They did their own testing. They found the same levels, even higher, and then they sued Procter & Gamble and they, they settled and Procter & Gamble agreed to reduce the levels to 20 parts per million. I think we found 65. Um, so I think it can be effective, but I don't, I don't think, companies hate, hate Prop 65 because of the lawsuits. Um, but I, like I said, I don't think it's a substitute for a full disclosure. And, and when I was actually um, working on the SB 258 in California that requires um, ingredient disclosure and cleaning products, and we were negotiating with companies, um, one of the things we negotiated around is giving them a five-year 
um, window before they had to disclose Prop 65 chemicals because basically they were like, we want to reformulate out of Prop 65 chemicals because we don't want to have to put that on our label because then we're just going to get sued because people are going to see that it's in there and it's a Prop 65 chemical, but it doesn't have a warning label because of thresholds. I mean, it gets complicated, but that's where ingredient disclosure, specific ingredient disclosure can help lead to re reformulation. So I would say if, if you were going to pick one policy, I would do full full ingredient disclosure. Um, and I've heard that, you know, consumers just want to know that it's that it's safe. So I think there's some merit in that, but without full ingredient disclosure, you can't have advocacy groups making sure that, you know, what they're using, um, you know, or be, being able to point out, well, this ingredient, you should avoid this or, or whatnot. So, yeah. And Mohan, you made an interesting point uh, before we started the panel about how Canada's system is actually kind of celebrated by industry. They're a big fan of the way we do things now. They're not big fans <laughs> of California's way. I'm sure the federal government would say, Canada's things, you know, and the most, we're pushing chemical safety first and foremost, but you're seeing that it's, uh, it, it, it's a little too maybe favored by industry. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, and just to go back to the point around um, the warnings versus full disclosure, I think it's, it's a, you know, one doesn't work without the other. At least that's how we've been putting it. We've, we've been saying we want the full disclosure, but also there is a subset, a group of chemicals that are really bad. And if they're there, we, people need to know in a very simple, clear way. Uh, so, so that's sort of how we've been, we've been putting it. But I do agree with, with you that without full disclosure, it can be, um, some, for you know, in specific cases, I think it would not be as, as useful. Um, but yeah, so we, we do have, um, I, I do hear this a lot, you know, chemical, uh, the chemicals uh, management approach in Canada is uh, the gold standard. Um, you know, a lot of people like it from the industry side, also from the government side. And um, that's because it, it's almost this, um, so if you compare our approach with the US approach, um, we have, I think, restricted more chemicals than, than the US at a national level. But if you compare our uh, approach with, it, with Europe, um, I think I did a recent sort of estimate with the help of a student, um, and I think the EU has about 1,500 chemicals that they restricted, Canada between 400 to 500. Um, so we're sort of, we have the system that's in between where, you know, government can, can say or claim, you know, look what we're doing, we're taking action on chemicals uh, when we're not really doing enough, um, but it's better than, than some, some countries. And they will point to the U.S., say the U.S. has only regulated how many? Uh, not California, but I think it's banned for 12? Yeah, cosmetics. Well, for cosmetics, yeah, they've yeah. like banned or restricted between 12 and 15. We decided there's not a hard number on that, but like the EU... I think it's around 1,200. Right. And then the, the point that I and my colleagues from the environmental and health NGOs make to agencies like Health Canada and Environment Canada is we shouldn't be judging how good our system is based on how many chemicals we regulated or restricted. We should be looking at the health outcomes. We should be looking at you know, rates of ADHD in children. We should be looking at um, our body levels of chemicals and seeing whether that's dropping or reducing, and, and also chemicals in, in the environment. Um, you know, th those are the, in the, the indicators or the numbers that we should be looking at. And we can only judge how good our system is if we you know, are able to show that we've reduced exposure to a certain extent where we're seeing that um, you know, chronic health outcomes are um, dropping um, in, in rates and, and I, what do you think, I'm sure Bruce, Bruce can, can speak more to that, but to me that sounds like the, the way we should judge a chemicals policy system. Yeah, and I think one of the, the first challenges is just having good public health surveillance. And for example, if you look at ADHD um, and some of the other mental health conditions, we don't have very good surveillance for it. And so has there been a rise in autism or ADHD? There's some evidence for that from the states and elsewhere. Uh, there's a little bit of that from Canada, but not very much. And we just really don't know. The best we can do is say, well, how many prescriptions are being filled for ADHD? So we just don't, we haven't kept up with uh, the kinds of chronic conditions that children and the rest of us deal with. 
And if the audience has any questions, now's a good time to share them. I have to say the one thing I like to always point when I talk to companies about labeling, because they're, they always say, there's just not enough room. There's not enough room. And we're like, in Canada, they, they put in Eng English and French. So you have plenty of room. In fact, <laughs> good point. I just sent that to um, um, the, uh, the assembly member that we're working with in New York. Um, on the period product disclosure because she's also hearing from companies that there's not enough room and and a nice you know Canada's not perfect what you have the disclosure for tampons but it's required in in English and in French and so they were like oh this is great thanks so <laughs> yeah there's room on I hear the label. that, I, I yeah. Hear that yeah. too, in Canada we have long labels and you know what until 10 years ago, ingredient lists weren't mandated on shampoo bottles or anything like that either. And we changed it. So now that is mandatory, at least except for fragrance, as you mm -hmm. said. Um, how far, how close are we to getting cleaning product ingredients disclosed in Canada? Um, I can't say that we are closer than we were, you know, last year, five mm -hmm. years ago or 10 years ago. I think it, it really comes down to, um, you know, the, the next uh, decision that the environment minister will be making around amending our toxics law or not, um, which I think is will give us a sense of you know whether we'll be able to see um, or we'll see better labeling on cleaning products. Yeah. Thanks. Any questions from the audience? Hi, my name is Esther. I'm originally from Spain. I moved here two years ago, and I was shocked, literally, to see how the ingredients from Euro is like 1,400 in cosmetics banned and here there is hardly any regulation. So I went and I spoke with Christia Freeland, the, uh, one of the member of parliaments here, and I had a meeting with Marco, who's the, the manager, and he was very open to everything I had to say, you know, like you need to label, you need to regulate, you need to do this and that. So he sent me this email that I haven't answered yet. <laughs> okay, so um, it's very interesting how he says, we have been in contact with the Minister of Health and he lists names. And then he says, I have some information to share about the current status of cosmetics regulations in Canada as well as the review of SIPA. So you know the... Muhammad is just talking about. Yes. So I'm very happy to report that Canada has some of the most stringent regulations for com cosmetics in the world <laughs> and restricts or prohibits the use of substances, blah, blah. I mean, he goes on, right? And then he ends... Please be assured that our government is committed to protecting the health and safety of Canadians and has a strong regulation for cosmetics and personal care products. I'd like to encourage you to write directly to the Minister of Health. So how do I answer this email? Really, because I knew everything here was not true, but of course I'm not gonna say, because first of all, I'm not Canadian. Second of all, I've just moved here, so I really don't know the, how do you, and uh, my question is, how do I approach this person who was actually very helpful? And he's answering the email saying, you know, send a letter to this ministry. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, good question. How should you respond? Because when you do, we all, all encourage um, citizens to actively get on their politicians, local politicians and federal, provincial, to make change and push for change. Um, and they'll always send you that letter back saying, we are doing our best and we are, you know, global leaders. What next? Is that, can we, do we respond or is it good enough that we've sent our initial letter? I, 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 think, I think you should respond. And I think what you just said is, is the perfect respond, uh, response. You should, you know, um, you should say that you know that that's not true and, and that um, you know that we are not doing enough and that we still have, you know, many toxics and products that should be banned or regulated. Um, I think the point that uh, Bruce made earlier today um, about how we should get more angry 
about this. Um, and we should show that to members of parliament and the people that we elect. Because often people don't, or, or members of parliament don't know that we care about this issue. So um, in this case, I mean, I've, I've met with a, lot of, with a lot of MPs and their staff, and, and often they just don't know. Uh, this is an issue that not many people know much about. So they go to Health Canada and they go to Environment Canada, they send them an email and they ask, and the response that they get from Health Canada, Environment Canada is probably what, what they sent you, which is, you know, we have the best system in the world, everything's great, don't worry. You know, we're, we're making sure that you're safe, which is not true at all. So, so we need to make sure that members of parliament know that this is an, an, an issue that we care about and that we're going to vote according to, you know, the action that they have or have not taken. Um, in the survey that we, uh, we did, we worked with a, a research firm and did a national um, survey around toxics. And we asked a question specifically about, you know, how many people would vote on this issue. So in the next elections, you know, would you consider voting for um, a party that took action or, or is committing to taking action on toxics or not? And I think one out of four considered it a voting, an important voting issue which was actually good. One out of four is, is good, but we need more than that. Um, and when pe members of parliament know that people will actually care and that this is something will get them elected or not, they're more likely to take action. Um, so so it's, it's great, and I thank you for sort of taking that first step of, of contact, contacting your member of parliament, but um, I definitely think that people should not be discouraged when they get a response that seems um, like a you know, it's coming from a template. Um, you should just e talk, uh, talk to them again or email them again and, and tell them that you're not satisfied. I think one of the things that this speaks to is that um, our, our, our leaders, our government uh, leaders, have two sometimes conflicting goals. One is to protect us, and I believe they want to do that. And the other is to make us feel protected. And if you look at how policies evolve, um, you may have a policy back in 1999, this is safe. Then there's all this science that happens. And if we don't have a new policy, what happens? We always refer back to 1999. So it's not until there's the science, the new science, and the demands for change that then you have a new policy and then it starts over again. <laughs> so I think partly what you're hearing is both a desire to protect us and uh, and a desire for us to feel protected. But in, in the process, there's a lot of things that get lost. And so we need to help make them aware of that new science and that we're concerned about these particular issues. Thank you. Uh, I've recently been hearing a lot of um, information about uh, all the chemicals that are being put in shampoos and soaps and how it's in, uh, affecting uh, young men and their virility and their yeah. ability to have healthy sperm and stuff like that. And I know uh, there's been a lot of talk about the women feminine products, but I wonder if you can, anybody can address some of the male uh, chemicals that are dangerous to them and the effects. Good question. Would like to address that? I mean, I can. I can take a stab at addressing this question. Um, so it, it's a, that's a very good question. We've often um, you know, focused the conversation, and, and rightly so, on, on women and, and young children because there's a you know, big element of vulnerability there. But we are seeing data um, about um, you know, fertility decreasing in men because of exposure to toxics. And I think more research is happening on that. Um, I know phthalates was one class of chemicals that was linked in some studies to um, impact on, on fertility in, in men specifically. Um, I think, I mean, when we talk about personal care products, uh, we, we did, Rump to Defense uh, Canada, my organization, uh, did a report where we tested personal care products that, that were marketed, marketed to men. So shaving creams and, you know, all the sort of things that only men use. Um, and we found all sort of toxics in them. And, and it was an interesting um, study because we asked volunteers to sort of uh, be, to participate in the, in, in, in the report or in the research, and they gave us their products and we tested them for, for what, I guess, what's in the product and whether it matches the label and what's hidden, what's, 
and they had no idea. They had no clue that they were using all these products that contain all sorts of things. And, and some of the, I mean, you can read the report online. I think it's called um, the Manscape um, Reports. Right, yes. Yeah. I remember yeah. that one. <laughs> In RamatilDefense.ca. I actually, I think I might have the, man, the report with me, so I can just leave it here for those who want to. The website uh, is loaded it. with really helpful reports, such as yes. Manscape, and yeah. if you're looking for and some, more details. some resources that provide tips around how you can avoid exposure to toxics. Um, but so it was interesting just uh, getting the reactions from them, and, and I think many of them were, you know, immediately said, "I'm going to start looking at other other things that, that may not contain toxics." So I think. Um, it, you know, when we talk about women, it's it's not just about women; it's about men. It's about the young and old, um, and you know, questions about uh, you know fertility. It's something that uh, it's it concerns people when you tell them that this is impacting your ability to have kids. Um, and I think looking at the data around fertility, you know, I don't want to misrepresent the data, but I think the um, fertility levels have dropped like. 50 percent over the past three decades or four. I don't remember the exact statistic. Something like that. About one out of six, one out of eight couples are infertile. Yeah. Uh, for a long time, there was uh, a lot of controversy about whether sperm counts and quality were coming down. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, a meta-analysis was done, bringing uh, dozens of these studies together, and showed pretty conclusively it is in fact happening. Um, there's the old ones like lead. Even extraordinarily low levels can damage sperm. And then there's the new ones like phthalates. And we know phthalates are uh, anti-androgenic. They reduce testosterone. So this is something we're all exposed to. There's been four studies of uh, phthalate exposures to pregnant women uh, who are carrying sons. And what they found is that the, the sons that are exposed to uh, higher levels of phthalates, the distance between the scrotum and the anus are shortened. They look more like the little girls uh, moving in that direction. And then when you look at, in a cross-sectional study, young men who have shortened antigenital distance, they're more likely, uh, from the high to the low, about seven times more likely to be infertile. And that's just a couple of the examples out there. Uh, but one in six to one in eight is pretty high. Um, and they're beginning to find more of these chemicals that are associated with reduced fertility. Uh, and yet most of our attention still seems to be focused on uh, IVF treatment, you know, which of course we understand in the short term uh, if people are trying to be to be to have children, uh, but if that's what we continue to do year after year and we're not trying to understand why, there's something really wrong with the system. Personal. This is very anecdotal, but for the past two summers, I was, and this is, I'm just going to say my own situation. I've been feeling really exhausted in the summers, and also low sex drive. And then I saw something from David Suzuki. It said sunscreen had the, all these horrible things on it, and he referred to a site, EWG, and I went there and I looked at all the sunscreens, and sure enough, the, it was a nice Neutrogene. It sounded like a good company I was using, and it had all these toxic things in it, and one of them, oxybenzone, was like the most toxic and was a hormone disruptor and was just, you know, lowering studies that shown it had lowered sperm counts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to switch to a mineral. Uh, sunscreen this summer and try and not wear any sunscreen if at all possible I and mean, that's just one personal situation thank you and actually Hawaii just announced that they are I think all of Hawaii or a state in Hawaii banning oxybenzone. they are it banning oxybenzone decimates yeah. coral reefs yeah. too it's so <laughs> as an endocrine so disruptor we think about how it affects our health but these also yeah. have broader impacts on the environment the environment at large sure. right? right I'm a very pissed off canary in the coal mine <laughs> Um, the multiple chemical sensitivities. I'd like some advice from all of you on a personal, um, you say that the, the answer is for us to all speak up, so help me speak up. I just moved into a new building that told me they used, you know, the loveliest cleaners that had no bad things in them, that's how they put it. And certainly no fragrances. They use at least 15 that do. And I've been locked in a conversation with the board of the rental building on how to change this. Whole hospitals have changed their policy in shorter times in this building. Um, <laughs> would you like a test case, Mohammed? How do we how do we convince a building owned by the city, populated by old people, 
to change their policy on what they use. It's poisoning me. My anger and my nose have been running freely since I moved in there. Oh, great question. What do you think? Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I wish I had an, an, an easy answer. Uh, I think, I mean, that, that's why we, we try to target our, our, or our focus is on, on regulations because we, it's, it's quicker. If we have stronger regulations, it's quicker to, to deal with um, you know, exposure f to toxics from products. So if we ban certain allergens from use in cleaning products, um, then we're closer to finding a solution to, to these, I guess, examples of, of exposure in you know, the, um, whether it's in your apartment building or condo building or workplace. Um, labeling is obviously a, a part of it, but... One of the groups I've been working with is called Healthy Babies, Bright Futures. Now, it seems like maybe we're on the other end of the age spectrum to what you were talking about, but um, what, what they're trying to do is to think about how do we make our cities healthier for uh, the developing child, and they're doing it in part because there's so much gridlock. This is a U.S.-based um, NGO. They're doing it because there's so much gridlock at the top. I was talking uh, about this with um, the sustainability uh, director in Vancouver, and he was very open to the idea of uh, thinking about toxics uh, and how to make sure that they're purchasing only safe products uh, for the daycare programs. And we were talking mostly about kids, but if there's other uh, programs that the city runs, there, there might be some options for working with the city to begin to shift uh, in that direction. Um, and there is some uh, material being developed for that. Again, Healthy Babies, Bright Future is really more about children, but the idea is that if we can protect children, it's likely to be somewhat protective for the rest of us as well. And just to add, thanks for sharing your story. I talk to a lot of people who have um, MCS. I get a lot of calls because it's extremely frustrating. A lot of times, at least in the U.S., um, they have even a hard time finding medical care because they're just like, you're, it's, it's in your mind, you're, you know, you're hysterical. Um, but we know that's not the case. But um, one thing that you could do is look at, um, the, in the U.S., the American Lung Association has developed uh, model policies for a workplace or a school for using fragrance-free, either going fragrance-free totally or like fragrance-free cleaners. And I actually, there's some of, um, I link to those policies on, in a blog I wrote on um, Women's Voices for the Earth's website. It's called Fragrance, the New Secondhand Smoke, question mark. But those are policies that you could actually bring, you know, and, and, and change to, to fit your needs to, to the, the folks that run your um, housing unit. Um, saying here here's a solution this is what we could do um, and there's great stats in there too that that show that there's studies that American Lung Association um, supports about workplace asthma etc but um, the other thing is I don't know if there's an equivalent in Canada but the e, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US has a safer choice program and it's basically a certified green cleaners and they have a label that's a fragrance-free certified label. So that's actually, the EPA actually certifies that this product is free from any fragrance ingredients, which um, I, don't, I don't know if there's an equivalent in Canada. I don't know if those products would be available in, in Canada. I'm sure some of them, I'm sure. So if you go to the EPA Safer Choice Program, you can actually search products um, that can be used for institutional use, like cleaning buildings. Um, by, you know, there's like a little search criteria, you could just put fragrance free, and I think there's over a hundred cleaning products now in that, um, with the Safer Choice fragrance free label, which is really helpful. And another thing to keep in mind, I've actually spoken to a number of people in Toronto with multiple chemical sensitivities that are having housing issues, and I've spoken to the um, uh, Ontario Human Rights Legal Clinic, and they have actually assisted dozens of uh, MCSers, people with multiple chemical sensitivities, uh, to work with their landlords to actually see change in their buildings. So don't be shy to get some free legal assistance from the, that clinic. Um, they have a great deal of experience. They've also worked with, with city-owned buildings um, and pushed them to change. 
So they're a great resource. There's also, I forget the name of the organization, I think it's the Center for Safe or Healthy Accommodation in Ontario. Um, and they have a lot of resources to uh, help with your situation as well. I know there are many people across the country and across the continent in your shoes. So you are not alone and there are tools to help for sure. Hey, thank you. What a great talk. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to hear this more about this topic, which seems to have gone underground for some reason. Um, um, I wanted to say that um, I do a lot of advocacy and talking to MPs and talking to MPs and uh, you know trying to use our, our citizens' right to, to, to say things. One of the things that are difficult, uh, or in my experience, is um, um, w I hear about these these chemicals, parabens, um, the aromatics, bisphenols, uh, um, plastic softeners, phthalates, all of these things that I've heard from a sci science or somebody's opinion that's very bad. Um, I, I understand that it you know, gets in our blood and these terrible things happen, but when I'm attempting to convince somebody or to, to motivate somebody, um, how do I explain that this chemical with a weird sounding name actually <laughs> has this um, effect that isn't related to, you know, there were the parts per million and the, the like, I don't know how to have these I, I try to have these conversations, but I, I don't know, I, bridging the, the science to the everyday, um, maybe you can help me uh, continue First, that First, do you have any tips? <laughs> Videos. Well, I mean, just, we, we haven't done one on EDCs, but we're working on one for endocrine disrupting chemicals, which will capture some of the ones you brought up as examples. And the, the challenge, what we try to do is to take the science and make it as um, easily digestible as we can. And um, I'll, I'll, I've got some cards with uh, the five different videos we have. You can look at them. You can subscribe to it. And so, you know, it, it might be a year. I do this basically kind of like out of the garage, making these videos. So it's not like we've got this big production uh, process. But um, if you subscribe, then you'll get the new ones. And we've got one on endocrine disrupting chemicals, which will capture some of what you talked about. Um, and then we've got one in air pollution, um, ADHD, lead and tobacco increasing the risk for ADHD, um, cause or cure, the one I sort of alluded to, we just released today. So there's there's a few out there that might help um, give you some ideas and maybe. Tell people your website again. Oh, website again. www.littlethingsmatter.ca no spaces, all small cap. And actually, the websites of all of our panelists would be a really helpful resource. And so, Jamie, do you mind uh, also sharing some quick tips on how to talk to people who just roll their eyes about this? And you know, when you're trying to convince family and friends to get rid of XYZ cleaner, and they say, well, it's on shelves, it's safe. Yeah, I feel like, well, just personally, I don't know, I haven't had to do a lot of convincing, because I, I, I people will be like, oh yeah, that bothers me too. I start to cough when I use this cleaning product or, or whatever it is. But um, I mean, one of the things, we have just have easy fact sheets, two-page fact sheets that you can give people. And your um, website again? It's www.womensvoices.org. And actually, I think I, some of them are just on that table. Um, that can be really helpful just to, to hand to folks. Um, and I think, at least and I, all of our work, I'm sure, it's, it's rooted in science. We're not just pulling this out of the air. I mean, we're, we're not saying, just making it all up. We're saying <laughs> these chemicals are harmful because there, is, there are scientific studies that suggest um, that we need to be concerned about them. Does that mean that this study is saying this absolutely causes cancer? No, you're probably never going to have that. But there's definitely um, um, an, a, enough research for certain chemicals that we should be concerned and move away from that chemical if possible. Any quick tips on how to communicate without, communicate the message on toxins without alienating your Yeah, I think I'm, I'm becoming, I'm increasingly becoming um, convinced that um, most people care. It's just that people don't have the time to think or worry about it because there's a lot to worry about. So it's about packaging it in, in a very, 
simple and easy way to understand. So I often, and that's why at, at in, in my organization, and I think other organizations do the same thing, we often list things and we say this is the top 10 um, you know, that you should avoid. Um, and and here, here are the, you know, the major sources of exposure that you can avoid um, you know, the, the exposures. Um, so you know, for example, um, parabens, you know, look at it in shampoos, look for it in shampoos, conditioners, other things. And, and if I'm talking to a friend, I usually target you know, the one thing that they use all the time. So let's say like someone, a friend of mine, is into hair gel. Um, and, and I notice they use it all the time. So I would talk to them about that specific product. So I wouldn't go and, and tell them, OK, so you have to replace everything in your kitchen, um, <laughs> get rid of this couch, buy another one, and also make your own personal care product. I, I wouldn't start there. I would start by just picking one thing and then also highlighting the benefits. So one thing that I often tell people is, um, or friends, um, that I, I found that, because uh, I used to use you know, sh shampoo and conditioner and all sort of things, and I started reducing using all, you know, all the personal care products that I, don't, that I used to use. Or now I, I, all I need is, is a bar of soap, natural soap, and a conditioner that's, that I know is, is, um, contains safe ingredients. And the quality of my hair is different. Like, it's actually better. It looks um, good, actually. Yeah. Thank you. So I highlight these things where I tell people, like, you know, a lot of these chemicals are actually not good for you. It's not just about the, the impacts that you don't see, that you may not see now, but may um, manifest later. But it's, it's about the, the differences that it makes on your skin or your hair um, and highlighting, like, the options that are there that could be good for them. Um, so I think it's really starting, you know, targeting one thing at a time, making it a simple message. and. Um, um, yeah, and just knowing who you're talking to and what, what, what the one thing that they're passionate about that you can get them to, um, you know, get their attention. So something I keep thinking about when, uh, with like certain chemicals not being listed in like some health products then, is there like how can we know that they're actually good for us if they're not even required to list all the ingredients? Sorry, for what kind of products? Like for like kind of like things that are branded as more healthier Natural products. Natural products. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's a good question. Silent Spring Institute, I think, was the organization that actually tested dozens and dozens of products to, to see whether their ingredient lists matched the actual ingredients within them. The nice thing was that the majority of the natural products were telling the truth. There was only a few that weren't, uh, versus some of the more mainstream products that were hiding more ingredients. Um, so that was one answer. Well, that's one element of the, of the question. But any, anyone have any thoughts on that? Can we trust I mean, those I think products? Without full disclosure, there's no way. Yeah. You, you have to have that to know. Because I know in the US, and maybe it's the same here, there's no, there's no regulation or requirements for what natural means. Um, so, or, so anybody could say this is natural, and, or any company can make that claim, but same in Canada. it's not. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's where you have full, when you have full ingredient disclosure, then you, you're able to make those comparisons or And then you hope that they tell the truth on the yeah. ingredient disclosure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just imagine it would be a problem like the trend year that it's Oh yeah. It, sure. It is like now. To, yeah. I would say that's probably a problem now with some products yeah. for sure. And that's why there's somebody mentioned EWG, the Environmental Working Group has their skin deep database and that is a database that has over sixty five thousand personal care products in it and it rates them from zero to ten. 10 being the most toxic hazardous, and they're basically b basing that score on authoritative lists that they're, they're pulling from to cross-reference the ingredients. And so that's, that can be a good source. Um, if, they don't, if that product doesn't disclose fragrance, then that's gonna ding, that's gonna ding them, and they're gonna get a low score for that because of the, the data get. And data EWG gets, also has, uh, EWG.org, I think. Um, it yeah, is. so it's an environmental working group, and they have it's called the Skin Deep Database, which you could just get through their to, through their main website, environmental working group, and they actually have a database for cleaning products, um, too. Which I'm sure will only a lot of become database. stronger uh, once well, California exposure. Yeah, is we listing. With, we worked with EWG and breast cancer prevention. Um, partners on the California and NRDC National Resources Defense Council on the California legislation that passed for ingredient disclosure. So if we're, before we wrap things up, um, I don't know if you have any final advice for audience on how to get involved, especially if we do want to see action on more disclosure and these regulatory changes. 
any, any, uh, anything you'd suggest in terms of lobbying and <laughs> audience activism, or whatever you might recommend? Well, I would just uh, say that, we, we, as I mentioned, we have an opportunity now uh, to address many of these issues that we talked about by strengthening some of the, the regulations that we have um, under the toxics law in Canada. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we're going to be find we'll, we'll find out in the next few weeks, um, by the end of June at the latest, what the government is planning to do. Um, and I'll be monitoring that. I'm, I'm constantly meeting with with people in Environment Canada, Health Canada, with MPs to talk about it. And hopefully, it will be a positive um, response. And if it is positive, I think this is where um, you sort of come in because. The more you sort of support action, um, because even if they say, "Okay, we're going to do this," that's only the beginning of a new pro process. Where now a bill will be introduced in in parliament, and it'll have to go through debates, and you have industry coming in and lobbying. Um, so there has to be strong support from members of the public that uh, this is something that is um, that people are looking for, and that the government should do. So the best advice would be, and this would be a bit selfish of me, is uh, to follow my group or other groups that are working on this. It's not just my organization. Get um, you know, uh, sort of updates about what's happening. And we usually issue you know, calls to action at specific times in a process where we say, like, in the next two, three weeks, really, this is where it matters, where you sign a petition or go meet with your MP or call an MP. Um, so that's the best way for you to be involved. Thank you. And Jamie, I know you at uh, your organization call this actionistas. Or you, call, you call on us to be actionistas? Oh, we have like <laughs> a super group of volunteers called actionistas. But I, I mean, I would just say don't underestimate the power of raising your voice. Um, especially, I have doing this work, I have seen um, it move major multinational corporations. Um, your call really, it really does mean something. And the other thing that we try to do, my organization, is um, bring women together to talk about their friend, to talk with their friends about the issue. So we have um, a green cleaning party kit that has a, a list of green cleaning recipes that are non-toxic. And it's a way to bring your friends together and talk about the issue in a nice little kit. We also are launching um, Detox the Box um, parties. Those are around our feminine care issue. <laughs> but um, the idea is to, and maybe I could talk to you about this, we could launch these in Canada, it would be awesome. Yeah. But the idea is to get together with your friends and learn more about the issue, talk, just kind of demystifying um, um, and kind of destigmatizing the idea that we can't talk about our period or menstruation. Um, um, and so we're do, that's a way we bring women together to start talking about these issues. And we always have like an action to do in those parties. So yeah, that's something we could talk about later. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Over a glass of wine, we can figure it out. <laughs> Bruce, any closing words of advice, wisdom? Yeah, maybe, maybe two thoughts. Um, one would be perhaps uh, look at the things that you do in your own homes. And whether it's choosing to cook from scratch uh, maybe start thinking about canning your own foods. Some way that you can begin to take control over the kind of um, foods you eat, which is one of the, the main ways we're exposed to, to toxins. Um, and maybe the other would be to kind of build on the idea of take one thing. You know, maybe that you, maybe you have a, a son with ADHD or a father with a heart condition. Uh, every one of those conditions has both a genetic and environmental component. And learn a little bit more about the environmental component. What are some of the things that might contribute to that? And um, in particular, think about it in context of SEPA, because this is a real opportunity to push um, our agencies, our government, to protect us. And if we can get this one right, um, it would have an unbelievable impact on what happens over the next generation or more. Um, and they seem to be receptive. And yet, of course, we know that there's going to be pushback. And that if the only voice they hear or voices they hear are from industry, um, it's not going to be as strong as it should be. Thank you so much to each of you. Um, you know, we do 
we do deserve the right to know what toxins are in our products. And thank you to these advocates. Um, we are better informed and inspired to act and get involved. So let's give them a big hand of applause.